Hey everyone, welcome to yet another episode of Gen AI Vlog. Today we're going to be talking about how to fine tune Florence 2 for object detection tasks. So now this is interesting because uh, this notebook that uh, thank for Piotr Skalski, that's from the RoboFlow team, provided here online that essentially provides a tutorial using Colab to fine tune a Florence 2 model for object detection. Now you might say, hey, YOLO algorithm, object detection, we've seen these things before, what's interesting? The interesting thing here about this Florence 2 is actually it's a multimodality model. Uh, so it not only detects object, uh, it also produces sentences, keywords, labels, things like that. So just want to give a shout out to this notebook here provided from RoboFlow team. And with that being said, let's dive into the code. So what is a multimodality model? Multimodality model means that it's a model that's fine-tuned to taking multiple inputs as well as producing multiple outputs. For example, one input could be image, an uh, image you encoded, and that's going to be the visual embeddings. And you can, of course, take a bunch of sentences. For example, you can say, what does the image describe? Things like that, or locate the objects in the image, so on and so forth. This will give you the text and location embeddings. Uh, so right off the bat, we're talking about a couple of different modalities of input arguments for this model. Uh, so the input goes in, goes to a couple of transformer encoders, uh, then decoders, and then it comes out. And when it comes out, it's not just a label class prediction, uh, it's actually multi-output as well. Uh, so right off the bat, you could have a paragraph. The image shows a person riding a red bicycle, and uh, this paragraph says the thing that it says, based on the information of this picture. Now you can, of course, go with object detection. It's gonna say, hey, person, the bounding box is 0 0.41, 0 0.15, so on and so forth, along with cars and whatever other labels that the image has. And then you can also combine it, right? Uh, so maybe the question says, locate the phrases in the caption, a woman riding a bike. And um, what is the location of that, right? Uh, that can be 0 0.41, 0 0.15, things like that. On top of that, last thing I want to mention is image segmentation. Uh, usually this is done with a different model called UNET, which is a separate task. But in a multitask multimodality framework, uh, you can actually have the segmentation as well. Uh, so in this notebook, in this episode, we're going to dive into this notebook and see what we can do. First things first, you want to check you have an NVIDIA chip running, and then you want to install a couple of libraries. On top of that, you want to download and configure the model. Transformers, flash attention, a couple of libraries, that these are required dependencies. You import a bunch of libraries, and then you use this chunk of code to load your model. When you load the model, make sure that you load the model artifact. And then on top of that, you also want to load the processor. So with that being said, you can make a basic inference. You can send a picture in there, and then you can just give a blank and then see what it does. Uh, right off the box, you will say dog, person, backpack, and those labels and bounding boxes are obviously correct. And then on top of that, you can also do some image captioning. And when you want to do image captioning, you just want to make sure the task and the text are written as detailed caption that will induce the model to produce the sentence that is doing the image captioning task. And if you run this inference, you're going to see that it says in this image, we can see a person wearing a bag, holding a dog, things like that. Uh, so that is the image captioning inference. Now, on top of that, you can say something and you can induce the bounding box, right? So you can say caption to phrase bounding, and then you type in whatever you want to say, right? You can say in this image, we can see a person wearing a bag, holding a dog, there are buildings, posts sky, clouds, things like that. And then the model will take this text as input and trying to locate the bounding box for the object that may or may not happen in the prompt. And that also happen in the image. Uh, so you run to this inference, you're gonna see a couple of more bounding boxes here. Building is also located along with a couple of other objects, dog, person, backpack, things like that you get the idea. Uh, so this is actually quite interesting because the model needs to be able to go into the sentence and locate the words that match with whatever label there is in the picture. 
Uh, so I would probably consider this a much harder model to train than the previous two tasks. Uh, but this model actually was able to take care of all these tasks out of the box. Now, next step is to fine tune your model because you always want to fine tune your model based on customized data. Uh, so first things first, you want to have a RoboFlow API key. You can acquire that API key from a RoboFlow package, from a RoboFlow account online. And then you want to have a data set. A data set actually we're going to use in this notebook is called poker cards. So let me take you to the directory. This is a directory for poker cards. And it's due to the credit of RoboFlow, JVUQO. And obviously all credits go to this person. The data set is actually very straightforward. We are talking about poker cards data set. You can click in. And this is what the raw picture look like. There are a bunch of cards on the table. They could be flipped. Uh, they don't have to be horizontal or vertical. They could be diagonal as well. And then you see the number seven here is obviously flipped based on the camera or mirror reflection. So they don't really have to look at the seven as how you and I write it on a piece of paper. So they could be flipped, and then obviously the bounding boxes are provided. Uh, for example, right now I'm looking at a six of diamonds, and that bounding box need to be correct. Now, given the premise that this data set is clean and that these bounding boxes are correct and the labels are also labeled correctly, you can see that the raw information of the data is actually listed out on the left hand side. You have cameras, you have classes. These are all the classes that you could predict. And then you have a bunch of other information. Uh, down here, you have bounding boxes for the four objects in this particular picture, things like that. Uh, so that is going to be the label that you can predict. That is going to be the bounding box you can predict. You get the idea. So we have a data set located. That's what we want to download. And now once you download the data set, you want to retrieve the annotations. And the annotations is stored in a JSON-L format. Uh, so what that means is it's kind of in this uh, ugly uh, list of things, and you want to extract that accordingly. So you have this class object written in this notebook for us, and that allow us to extract the labels, the bounding boxes, things like that. And then on top of that, obviously you want to create a training set and a validation set. You use this chunk of code and data loader library to do that for you. After that, you will have a train loader and a validation loader. With that being said, next thing to do is set up your training configuration using LoRa config, just like that. And then you can print out the parameters. Now here, I can see that there are a total of 272 million parameters and a trainable percentage is about 70 uh, Since this is low rank adaptations, which is also known as LoRa, we're not training 100% of the parameters. We're only training a percentage of that. And whatever junk that you are generating, you want to clean up the cache so that you can save and preserve most of the memory in the training process. With that being said, we have a couple of helper functions to help you run the inference so that the helper functions can be called during the training process. And this allows us to visualize what is the performance. Now, for example, once a function is defined, you can see that here we use HTML tool uh, to render the picture in the following fashion. Uh, you have a picture, and then you have bounding boxes, labels, things like that. So with that being said, you can call upon this inference function so that during the training process, you can kind of visualize the results as the training process continues. So now let's take us to the final training model, which is this function here. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. Right off the box, we have optimizer, and that's just going to be the atom optimizer. We have number of training steps, a learning rate scheduler. Uh, these are just parameters based on the optimization process. And then you can render the inference to print out the results, see what you're looking at. And then the main magic happens from line 15, which is in this for loop. Now notice that this for loop starts with every epoch. One epoch, you can think of that as every iteration. And in that every iteration, you're going to do a couple of things. First thing is this first for loop down here. Uh, this actually train on the training data. It will actually go into the tokenizer, tokenize everything, uh, make an inference, compute the loss function, uh, and then run the back propagation. And then this line of code generates a couple of data. For example, the learning rate scheduler, the gradient, things like that. And then in the end, it records the loss function by appending the loss to the training loss. And uh, since this is the training data, we print out the training loss just for the sake of transparency. 
Uh, so once that's done, notice that we also have the evaluation. In the next for loop in the evaluation, notice that we do not want to update the gradient. Uh, so that's why we say with torch dot no grade. Uh, so in this case, we do not want to do any backward propagation because you want to train the Florence 2 model on one set of data and then do another set of performance checking on a different set. If you are updating gradients in this evaluation set, you're kind of cheating a little bit and you do not want that. You want this performance to be as pure and as honest as you possibly can. So with that being said, notice that we just calculate the loss and then we print the loss and then that wraps up the second for loop. In the second for loop, once again, you do not want to update your gradient descent. And then in the end, make an inference, save your model, and then you are done. That is going to be this train model function. So once this function is ready, uh, you can, of course, start training. In this following couple of lines, you will initiate a training. Uh, in this case here, I did 10 epoch, and then I print out the pictures. Now, I got to be honest with you guys, I couldn't really visualize the multi-label performance, uh, considering that the prediction has bounding boxes, has labels, things like that. So human eyes couldn't possibly look at all of this information and determine this is doing good or not. We need to do a little bit of a, a data visualization to visualize truly what the performance is. So you can, of course, make an inference. That would be something very basic. And then uh, you might see more bounding boxes pop up here. Maybe the fine tuning process is doing something good for the model or something similar. Now, of course, that's one way to go. Uh, there are better ways to go. In the bottom, you can, of course, calculate the mean average precision. And then we're maybe talking about 60% for these two metrics. And then you can kind of argue, say, hey, maybe that's not that bad, considering we have so many labels being predicted. And then one last thing I want to show you is this confusion matrix. Since we indeed talked about a couple of different labels, right? Because these are poker cards. Poker cards have a particular label, right? You're either 10 of clubs or you're not 10 of clubs. So the label is well-defined, given there's an image there. With that being said, you can kind of draw out this confusion matrix of all the cards that's been existing in that data set. And you notice that most of the most of the observation fall on this diagonal. And that's kind of what you want to see and what you also expect, because that means the model has done something correctly. Now, in the end, you also have something here that it's probably unknown. Uh, that's why you see a couple of mislabeling on the right-hand side. But that's OK. I think most of the predictions uh, happen on the diagonal, which is something that uh, should be a good sign. With that being said, last but not least, you want to save your model and then you're kind of done. So hopefully you like this episode. Hopefully this episode shares some light of what does it mean when we say make an inference of a multimodality model, and then also how do we fine tune that model? Thank you for watching, subscribe and like.